and I'm encouraged to see younger children. Thank you for coming. The Lord Jesus loves children. I was thinking at the morning meeting just of what he said, or what it said in Luke chapter 8, when he went to the home of Jairus, and there's a wee girl of 12, very ill, not just ill, but dead. And it says, Jesus took her by the hand and lifted her up. And the original language that he spoke to the wee girl was, little lamb, rise up. He took her by the hand. Can you imagine feeling the hand of Jesus touch your life? And that's what I'm looking for today. That somehow the hand of the Lord would just touch our lives. You would notice too, if you were listening carefully to Bob Hewitt praying, he talked about the spike going through the wrist because the scholars, you see, would have it thought that the nail print is not necessarily in the palm of his hand. I don't want to get any theology, but they would have said that the nail going through the palm of the hand would have wrenched away when on the cross. And perhaps the spike that they used went through the wrist and the Greek word for hand includes the wrist. As when the Lord said to Thomas, put your finger in the wound. The word for finger there is the same word for hand in Greek. The, word, the Greek word for hand includes all parts of the hand, wrist included. That's just a wee bit of theology, deep as in our toes. I have been given the task over these two sessions to um, address the topic, who is my neighbor? If you had to ask the people of Ukraine today, who is your neighbor? They would immediately say, and the answer would be Poland, Slovakia, Moldova, Estonia. These nations as neighbors to Ukraine have opened their hearts and opened their borders to the people of Ukraine in their need. You cannot get up at any time to preach without thinking about Ukraine and what the nation is going through at this time. And uh, we want to keep them very much um, in our mind for prayer. The man that I'm indebted to for giving me such um, spiritual motivation was a man called Colin Tilsley. He was the founder of GLO. And uh, God laid on his heart to reach out to the world through um, gospel literature, if you like. And uh, he founded the work of GLO in Australia and New Zealand, and then he came to the UK. And that's a work that I was involved in with Cathy for 40 years leading that work. My wife and I, and particularly Cathy, did 50 GLOW teams in the summer over that time span that we were involved in GLOW. Cooking, catering, caring for young people. So we love young people. Um, Colin Tilsley had an impediment in his speech. It was because of trauma as a child, his parents were missionaries in India and at five or six years of age, he was put on a train in North India to go to the Nilgiri Hills to get his education. It was so traumatic for a wee boy of six, it left him with an impediment. But when he sung, he had no impediment. He was a beautiful tenor singer. I'm into tenor singers today, Joan Abney and Colin Towsley, but he used to sing a song entitled, Others. That was the title. Lord, let me live from day to day in such a self-forgetful way that even when I kneel to pray, my prayer shall be for others. Yes, others, Lord, yes, others, let this my motto be. Help me to live for others that I might live like thee. It's a beautiful piece and the world lovely lyrics. Who is my neighbor? Our title, taken from Luke chapter 10, 
verse 29, uh, an expert, clever, intelligent, um, intellectual. It says he was an expert in religious law. He asked the Lord Jesus a theological question. How to obtain eternal life. The Lord Jesus, uh, such a model in so many ways in communicating one to one, he answered the man's question with a question. It's a very helpful way if you're in discussion with people on the gospel or in Christianity. It's very helpful to answer a question with a question. That's what Jesus did. So Jesus said, um, what does the law say? The expert in religious law gave the right answer. He had up here in his head the right answer. Love God and love your neighbor. Jesus said that's the right answer. Do this and live. So the man, sometimes in this exchange of question and answer, sometimes people get a little caught out or embarrassed. So uh, in order to look good in the eyes of Jesus, this expert in religious law then says, well, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? And that prompted the Lord to give what I often call timeless parables. Absolutely timeless. And so uh, we're going to take a moment to read uh, this parable. It's well known, Luke 10. You know the passage well, but Let's come to the word freshly today and capture the context of the setting that we're reading. Luke 10 and verse 30. Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man, and careful to note the different cultures, was traveling on a trip from Jerusalem to Jericho. He was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along, but when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road, passed him by. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan, in complete contrast to the Jewish man who was lying wounded, this despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion on him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man in his own donkey, took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now, which of those three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. And we trust that God will indeed bless this parable that we know so well and we've known all our life. And yet, uh, the more that I come to study the Word, uh, it becomes alive if you take time to freshly study it. And just as an aside, let me say this, that in Luke's Gospel, there is a lovely study on the word other or others. If you go back to Luke chapter 4, the Lord Jesus has just commenced his public ministry in Capernaum. He's 30 years of age. He's emerged out of Nazareth, and he's in Capernaum, beautiful Capernaum by the sea. And he's ready to do teaching and miracles. And the people of Capernaum say, we love you, just stay here, remain here. And in Luke 4, 43, it says, Jesus says, I must preach the gospel to other cities also. J.B. Phillips says in his translation of that passage, for this is my mission. This is my mission. Other cities, other people. I cannot remain here in comfort zone of Capernaum. There are others that need to be reached. That, for me, is the vision of Christ. Other cities, other areas of a city, 
that need, need to be reached. When you come over to Luke 10, the beginning of Luke 10, the time scale is quite different. He's not at the beginning of his ministry. He's at the end of it nearly. After three years of public ministry, he's um, on his final journey from Galilee down to Jerusalem. And he has the final thrust and push in mission. And it says he asked 70 others to join him. What a glow team that was. 70 others. And two by two, they were to go into each village between Galilee and Jerusalem. And they were to tell the people, they had to go ahead of the Lord and tell the people that the Messiah is coming and to prepare for his coming. And they went forward. And in that great chapter, so many lessons to be uh, picked up on. It's not the vision of Christ, but it's the strategy of Christ. If you to examine Luke 10, you would find that the Lord gives clear, distinct uh, instructions on how to do mission. Go into a village, go by door by door, and if they receive you, fine. If they don't, then knock the dust off their feet and move on. And don't take any baggage with you. Uh, don't stop for greetings and chit-chat. And this is an urgent mission. So many lessons because others needed to be reached and others were used. They are unnamed. The teams that the Lord has used over the years to send out into the harvest field are often unnamed people. And so not only do we have other cities in Luke 4, we have other servants in Luke 10. And then, of course, in the same chapter, we have this phrase, the other side. If in Luke 4 it's this vision of Christ and in Luke 10 at the beginning, it's the compassion of, it's the strategy of Christ. Then when we come to the parable of the Good Samaritan, it's the compassion of Christ. That's what's being emphasized as we think of the man being helped. Uh, as you move to the end of Luke's gospel, one of the hurtful, mocking uh, statements made by those that stood at the cross they said, he saved others. Let him save himself. How true it was of Christ. He saved others. That was his life. It wasn't for self. It was for others. And so, <laughs> may I say it kindly today, in this self-focused society that we live in, we are so concerned, and I say it to my shame, we're so concerned about ourselves, our own interests, our own pursuits, our own comfort. Oh, to find men and women and young people that consider others before themselves. So that's an aside. The other side. It's interesting that even a godless prime minister that we have in the UK uh, knows some detail of this parable. Because uh, in his comments about Ukraine, he said, we won't pass by them on the other side, Boris Johnson said. And the world knows some of the, uh, the terms and knows the content of some of these priceless parables. We will help people in need, says he. We won't pass by on the other side. There's a real danger to keep yourself safe and remain on the other side. Gathy and I have been great friends with the um, retired chief constable of Ulster. They used to come, both George and Ruth, on glue teams to me, with me and with Gathy to Newcastle to the Northfield tent. So much so that I conducted their wedding, their marriage. So I've been friends for life with them. When I was doing a mission in Scrabble Hall years ago, George was an ordinary police constable in Inniskillen. I remember him coming to visit me in David Rutherford's home because he was off work with trauma. And he recounted to me his experience. Working in Inniskillen one night, he said, with a colleague we were going to just take a walk through the town. And he said, we sensed 
we sensed something not right. So we decided to separate. You go one side, I'll go the other side as we walk through. His colleague, as walking through the town, came to a certain point where there was a lamppost. Unknown to him, in the litter box of the lamppost, there was a bomb. And as soon as he came to the lamppost, the IRA detonated the bomb and blew that colleague into eternity. When it went off with a sudden uh, screech, George is on the other side. And in a split second, he has to decide, do I go over and help my colleague, or do I remain where I am on the other side and keep myself safe because they may be waiting with guns to shoot somebody who come to help them? He said, I never hesitated, John. I ran to where my colleague lay bleeding, tried to help staunch the blood, but couldn't. He died. But he couldn't remain on the other side. This little message this afternoon, I want to emphasize three simple things. I want us to think about identifying our neighbor. Who is our neighbor? Identifying our neighbor. Then I want to say something about relating to our neighbor. How do we relate? And then, how do we preach to our neighbor? These are the three points that I want to emphasize. Identifying who is my neighbor. In one sense, the religious expert uh, raises the question, and it's a good question, who is my neighbor? When the priest and the temple ass assistant arrived on the scene of the attack, what they saw was a body, a body, lying half dead, bleeding and helpless. They didn't see a fellow human being with feelings, with pain, perhaps with a wife and a family back in Jerusalem. All they saw was a body. Every day, people cross our path. How do we see them? How do we see and identify the people that we interact with day by day? Because there's many people that cross our path every day in one context or another. It may be at work, maybe in the community, maybe with neighbors where you live, whatever the, the context. It may be just through social interaction. Here is my conclusion to the question. Who is my neighbor? My conclusion is to that question is, God has prepared someone for me to meet and to share the gospel with. I personally believe that uh, God prepares people that we can relate to and be there at a God-appointed moment. It's not everybody that passes your path or crosses your path that God has appointed for you to speak to. But there are people that God has planned for you to meet, and that is your neighbor. What do I mean? I've been to Africa. I'm exhausted preaching at the OM conference in Zambia. I'm on the way home. I'm a bit un annoyed because <laughs> the, the connection in Dubai has got an eight-hour gap before I get my next flight. Where will I spend the fit eight hours? Uh, so I go to the VIP lounge, thinking I could charm my way in as a Scotsman and get all the facilities of the VIP. No way. Because Dubai Airport is perhaps for me the busiest airport I've ever been in my life. Thousands of people. And the lounges are full to the neck, no matter where you go at certain times. So here I'm, uh, I'm wondering, where do I go? And I, I, I find a lounge, and you know, it's packed to the guns. And I'm standing, and this man sits, he says, sir, if you're looking for a seat, there's a seat here. The person has just left. I said, excellent, I'm leaving the seat. So I sit down in the seat, and uh, I take my Bible out. I have a practice, George Verver taught me that, 
Don't waste any time. Read whenever you get a minute to sit. And so this gentleman that offered me the seat, he begins a conversation. I discover he's heading to South Africa, coming from Portugal. And so I say, well, I'm heading to Scotland. I just come from Zambia. I was at a Bible conference um, by an organization called OM. He said, I know OM. Oh. He said, yes. I'm, I'm an architect in Pretoria. And OM South Africa wanted offices reveni- renovated, and I was the architect. I know the leader, Francis, Francis Vuzlo. I said, I know Francis well. He said, I know him. And so the eight hours gap that I had passed very quickly. That man poured his heart out. His family circumstances, his own difficulties in life, the spiritual input that was needed, it was a God-appointed moment. And in life, you don't get that every day, but you need to be ready for moments when God will bring somebody across your path that you can pour the gospel into. It doesn't need to be in the Dubai airport. Two weeks ago, Kathy said, you better get a haircut. You're going to Woodford. And so I go to the hairdresser and uh, the girl I know well because it's just next to the glow center. So I've been going there for years. She says, have you not been traveling to your... She knows that I do a bit of traveling. I said, no, I haven't. During the pandemic, I haven't done any traveling. What have you been... I said, I've been doing videos. My preaching on videos. If you go to my YouTube channel, you'll get a message on the afterlife. That's my recent one. Oh, she said, you know this? I had a friend that told me just recently, they've had some experience. They said they've been born again. I said, wonderful. And before I get my hair fully cut, I've shared the gospel with a hairdresser. She promised to look up the video. That's my neighbor. The person that God has appointed to come across my path or your path if you're ready just to take hold of the opportunity. Going back to the George Hamilton story, I remember George saying, see that night, John, before we went out on the street, that colleague was asking me about the gospel. And I just regret now I didn't take the time to more fully explain the gospel. How many of us have lost an opportunity that God gave us and we let it slip? Or we just were a bit afraid? Or we were just a bit unsure how to handle it? And so we have to identify our neighbor by recognizing the person that God has prepared for us to meet in our journey of life. Relating to my neighbor, you've got a clock in this. New church. Oh, I see it. I'm blind. I won't be long. I'm into short preaching these days. Relating to my neighbor. In this parable, Jesus gives a beautiful picture of how to relate to someone in need. The despised Samaritan, as Jesus called him, he gave practical, financial, and spiritual help to this man. He used his own resources to give practical help. I've often wondered, where did he get the bandages? Did he tear the hem of his uh, garment that he was wearing? The oil and the wine. He used his own resources to soothe the man's pain. He needed, essentially, to get down on his knees to help them. In order to relate to this man in need, he couldn't help him by giving him a lecture or telling him, get up on your feet, man. He dropped to his knees and no doubt cradled him in some way to soothe his pain. He needed also to lift the man up and help him onto his form of transport, a donkey. He paid for the accommodation that the man was needing and uh, he needed to spend time to recover and if the cost of the accommodation was to be more he said I will uh, repay it on my next visit what does it mean let's be very practical today what does it mean to demonstrate the love of God 
to those who are your neighbor or neighbors. Simple. Got it a um, couple of weeks back. She said, um, I've just discovered that our immediate next door neighbor that Kathy has a good relationship with, um, she was 60 recently. And the neighbor up for her, she was 70. So I've invited them both to a local hotel for afternoon tea. Simple. But how effective. Practical, but helpful to show the love of Christ to a neighbor. Relating to people in practical kindness is so important. When I produced the little booklet, you may or you may not have seen it during the pandemic, I was encouraged by my secretary to write an article on the pandemic. And I wrote a little article, and then it became six articles, and then it got printed. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Keep me safe till the storm passes by. Anybody seen that article, that little booklet? because John Hall took a lot. And, uh, and so um, I felt challenged in my own soul. I'm asking friends who are taking these booklets, share it with your friends who are not saved. Share it with non-Christians. And so the Lord gave me courage, and I took a, pass, a, a bundle, and I went door to door in my own street. I said, I'd like to give you a gift. There's a little booklet about some uh, sermons that I pr- would normally preach, but I put it in print. Would you like to accept it? It's not easy to go to your immediate neighbor and demonstrate and share the gospel. I don't know what you like, but that's not easy uh, for me just to knock a door that's immediately uh, to you. So I did that and handed in that little booklet. You'll be interested to know that God blew me away in this sense that we've printed 25,000 of these booklets. And the requests that have come, even just the other day, someone said from Northern Ireland, Could, I've just read this booklet, keep me safe. Could you send me 10? I want to give it to non-Christians. And so uh, it, it's another way of communicating the gospel through um, the booklet. I didn't charge for the booklet. I said to people, and Woodford have been very kind in, in giving donations for the supply of the booklets. But God has raised for me £40,000 from these booklets that I've been able to send to Africa to full time missionaries and in India who are in desperate need of support financially. It's just amazing how we can reach out. And uh, leading on from the booklet came the idea that we should do some videos. So I've done, I think, nearly 40 videos preaching the gospel and distributing these, relating to people. Perhaps those that love these video messages um, are missionary friends that I have who are on the front line in Africa, Zambia particularly, One of them just said the other day, John, this one on afterlife, heaven or hell, is the choice before people. He says, John, I've listened to it three, four times, so I've got the whole thing in my head, and I'm able to preach it now in Bemba to non-Christians. Relating to people in a language that they understand and in a format that people can understand. And so, how to relate to people? Over the years, I've tried to relate to to men uh, that I played golf with. I found it was one of the best opportunities that I had because guaranteed for myself or anybody like me, uh, people ask, what do you do for a living? Are you retired? No, I'm not retired. I'm still working. What? What do you do? Oh, that's a very unusual job. And it opens the door, and I can tell you, scores of times, I've been able, between shots, because the boys would say, that was a God-given shot. You know, hot a tree and come back out. So, you know, the fellows relate. They understand where you're coming from. Relating to people where they're at. Some years ago, I had a very close friend, 
that was in business. And uh, you'll forgive me for saying this, please don't tell anybody else beyond Woodford. But he used to invite me to Ibrook Stadium for the ladies. That's a football stadium. Because he had a table there that invited customers and got a slap-up meal, beautiful meal. And he used to include me. So when I'm sitting at the meal, guaranteed every time, the man next to me said, what do you do for a living? I said, I'm a preacher of the gospel. What? You know, I had more opportunity to share and relate to people in that stadium, one to one. Incredible. One day, I wasn't invited to the table. I just went in in the hope of getting a ticket to get in. Something, some things. And I was praying, Lord, help me to get a ticket, because tickets were scarce. And uh, there's an old man standing, and I said, you wouldn't have to have a spare ticket. He says, in fact, I have. And I had just decided, the next person that asked me, I'm going to give them it. I said, that's an answer to prayer. He says, what? I said, well, I'm a Christian. He says, come in with me, John. Right into the <laughs> main stadium, right in behind all the pundits. Brilliant seat. He, shout, he shouts to all the boys in the same row, boys, I have a preacher with me. Watch your language today. You know, I related to that man and to that situation because I was interested in what they were interested in. And the door opens and the opportunity is given to share the gospel. Now we come to the challenging part. How to preach to my neighbor. You can be kind, you can be polite, you can be mannerly, and you can live without speaking anything about the gospel. You don't need to share any truth of the gospel. Just live your life. Some people take that view, that's all you need to do. But my uh, conviction is that you need to also, once you've built a relationship, once you've established some form of, of relationship, you need to have the opportunity, when God creates it, to share the gospel. When and how to plant the seed, of course, in a friendship, takes wisdom. My experience looking back over the years was um, when we run alpha courses in the assembly that I was in, they proved to be so productive because it enabled people to ask questions. And I found the value of discussion um, in these Alpha courses. Having listened to Nicky Gumbel present his message and video, and then go into a smaller group, and they become uh, really lively, because people like to give their opinion. And uh, if we're going to uh, <coughs> preach the gospel, one of the great issues and one of the great features and lessons in life is, before you preach, you need to be willing to listen. I've seen people that are so intent on preaching and they don't give the person they're preaching to an opportunity to talk and they preach at someone. And that is non-productive. You need to be willing to listen, to understand where people are at and where they're coming from. And uh, for example, personally, I find it helpful to acknowledge to a Roman Catholic that I might be talking to that a lot of what you believe in the Roman Catholic Church, I believe. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe on Christ dying on the cross. And you take common ground where Roman Catholics have no hesitation to go in full guns blazing to try and show the differences between evangelical Christianity and Catholicism you would antagonize the person. And so, if you're going to preach, you need to have an understanding of where people are and where they're coming from. My great conviction in preaching to your neighbor is to speak well of Jesus and uh, what he means to us. Now, I remember doing door-to-door -door visitation in a town called Peebles. It's a very nice town on the borders. And churchy people, lots of churches, and the assembly was a small assembly. I used to go for weeks at a time and do door-to-door -door visitation. 
And I remember coming uh, to one particular large house, and the lady came and got into some conversation. I discovered she was the bank manager's wife, and she was a strong, uh, ardent churchgoer. And uh, I didn't appreciate this until much later, because she was offended by my approach. Because I said, you're a sinner. Bank manager's wife, I know, you're a sinner. I know oh, she was upset. Now, soon after, she got saved. And she said to my friend that I used to stay with, Ruth, um, uh, Ruth, uh, it doesn't matter. Ruth uh, said, John, the lady was really offended that you calling her a sinner. I lacked wisdom. I could have said the same because when it comes to that kind of issue, I remember being on, being interviewed on the radio years ago in Bristol. And this interviewer said, what are you going to tell people when you get on the doorsteps? I said, I'm going to tell them the sinners. <laughs> you know, well, let's be forthright here. Let's not pull any punches. Bit unwise, but in that sense. So the fellow put me on the spot. He said, well, what is sin? What is sin? And sometimes you get confronted with a question that's not as easy answered as you think. And so when you're preaching the gospel on a one-to-one -one basis, the basics that I'm trying to suggest this afternoon are be a good listener. Be wise in your terminology. Don't minimize the need for, a, for sin to be addressed and for the cross to be explained. But my, uh, my uh, emphasis would be, speak well of Jesus. That's our task in sharing and preaching the gospel. Tell people about Jesus. And you know, I often think of the man of Gadara, <laughs> this wild a uh, wild man that nobody could live with, lived in grave, a graveyard, tried to chain him, couldn't he be chained? Jesus freed him, saved him. Oh, I want to follow. No, he says, you go back. Back to people that know you and tell them what great things God has done for you. And so we want to tell people about the great things that Jesus can do. I want to just see how we go with discussion. Um, uh, have you had a chance to look at the app? There it is. What was the motivation? So, what I'm looking for, and I enjoy some discussion. If uh, you sit quiet waiting for somebody else, then I'll just call your name out, so you better be ready. Um, we need a free, open uh, kind of discussion um, before we come to, for me, the most important, what is our motivation to reach unconverted people? So, looking at the parable, looking at the scripture, uh, the question is, what uh, was the motivation that moved the Samaritan to help the wounded man? Who's going to break the ice? Jonathan Hall. You break the ice, give us an idea, then others will come in freely. Good start, um, because there are different ways we can be motivated. George Verva used to say to me, if we were to pay people for giving out tracts, he said, there would be a lot of tracts given out. People would be motivated by money. We could be motivated by duty, a sense of duty. I'm a Christian, I need to tell somebody about it. And so we're driven or motivated simply by duty. Or we could be motivated by need. We see someone in a set of circumstances that, humanly speaking, are painful. And a broken marriage, an alcoholic, a drug addict, so many different ways. And we see them in their need. But how then... Do we get back to Jonathan's answer? How do we get motivated by compassion? For that's what it says in the passage about the Samaritan. 
He was moved by compassion. So how do we get moved by compassion? That's the question. Ladies are free to make an input here as well in this church. So, because you know who they are and you love them, you want to respond. Is that your thinking? That's good. Anybody else like to comment on compassion? One or two leaving. Remember, here's, here's the, the context of the passage. It would probably be obvious that the man lying wounded was a Jew. Jesus infers that. And the man that was going to help him was a Samaritan. Now, this divide in humanity is worldwide. Even here in Ulster, there are two sections of the community and you go across the world and you'll find that division, that polarization between people. And that is a major obstacle. Would you help someone that you normally would have no contact with within your community? What is going to motivate people in the evangelical church to reach Roman Catholics, for example, in West Armagh? Duty? Need? Yes, love? Jesus makes the difference. Jesus in your heart makes the difference. That's what produces the motivation. That's very helpful. Any comments, any other comments before I go on to the second question? Okay. What is our motivation to reach unconverted people? John Hall, let's come and get people actively involved in this discussion. You don't need to have five minutes, just give me a response. Well, it's about like the, the three fellows in the Old Testament who discovered the city that was empty and they said, we do not well to hold our peace while the city is in there starving and we're here amongst the so, so much abundance. So we need to go and tell them. You have what people need. That's an answer, that's good. What is, what is our motivation to reach unconverted people? That helps us to be motivated to pray for people. You will reach people that you pray for. That's a good point. That's helpful. Very good. The command of Scripture. Obedience. Go ye into all the world. That means arma. That means uh, people that we rub shoulders with and that we meet day by day. Anybody else for comment? Any ladies? Yes. I think the main motivation that's going to drive me and has driven me for 50 years is my love for Christ and his love for people. And if I want to be like Jesus, then I need to love people. And that is, love is the motivator. Paul said that. He, he was constrained by the love of Christ. Now, more challenging. How many people, I heard Raymond do a little bit of sharing in the morning meeting. Would you like 
And I'll just give you a couple of minutes, Raymond, because I don't want you to take 10 minutes. Who have you been able to share the gospel with over the past month? <laughs> Even this past week. So that was Polish people that you were speaking to. That's that's wonderful, Raymond. That's that's so encouraging to know that there are people that you can't even speak to in their language, and yet you can. Uh, I have preached all my life in Glow teams through translators, <laughs> and uh, I remember once, if you don't mind me telling this, I was in Spain, in Madrid. And I had beside me, as a translator, uh, Lucho Velez from Bolivia. And uh, I was going great guns. The crowd was growing more and more. It was getting bigger. And I was giving all I could through the preaching, through the translation. So at the end, I said, Lucho, how did that go? Oh, I says, John, you were going so fast, I lost you. So I just gave them my own message. <laughs> so... It's interesting. Um, who else would like to share just perhaps something you've witnessed to or something that you've just uh, uh, been thinking about that you could relate to? Sorry? Excellent, excellent. That's just using the opportunity that someday with their initiative opens a way up. Uh, and we learn from each other. We can pick up on just tips that each uh, can share. Anybody else want to share just where they've been talking to or how they can relate? Don't be shy. Actually, it's quite interesting um, even to ask the kind of question that I might ask now before I finish. Have you got somebody invited tonight to hear the gospel at this meeting at 7 o'clock? Has anybody got somebody in their mind that they've invited and praying that they would come?
That's very helpful. The right person sharing with the other right person. And sometimes you need to say, could I just stand back and get somebody else just to answer that question? They maybe know more than I do. So uh, wisdom is needed on how to answer questions. Anybody else? Let's get finished. Well, I would like you to think about uh, tonight, and we'll take a moment to pray, that there might even yet, between now and seven, you might have the courage to pick up the phone and phone a friend and say, I've got an unusual Scotsman at the church tonight, and you might be interested to hear him. So would you like to come? And it's amazing if uh, the Holy Spirit is uh, involved in that kind of thing, then uh, they might just come. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the parables of Jesus. Thank you for the teaching that the Lord gave so long ago and so relevant for today. We do understand, Father, on the journey and the road of life, there are many people wounded and bruised and broken, their life shattered and in need of help and in need of compassion. Help us to be alert, to realize who our neighbor might be and save us, Lord, from going past on the other side. So we commit this little bit of teaching to those who have been willing to wait. And we do pray that tonight, as we preach the gospel, there might be those there that need to be saved. We commit our session to you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much, everyone, for being with us.